You're listening to Addiction Radio. Old school, the new cool. Hello, this is Mark Dynamics, and you're on Sydney Rave History. There you go, got that out of the way before we forget. <laughs> cool. All right, cool. So how old are you, Mark? 39. 39. Yeah. And when we first met, I noticed you had a slight English accent. Yep. Um, yeah, I was born in England, born in London, 1975, and uh, spent most of my childhood in a place called Weymouth down in Dorset, uh, in a lovely seaside resort. And then my parents decided to move, emigrate over to Australia when I was 11. So we moved out here, lived in the sort of western suburbs uh, until I was 16, and uh, then I got out of. I was. Uh, I would have, it would have been 92, 17, yeah, 92. And then I found parties and raves, early 93. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so does being from England influence your musical? Style? Definitely, yeah, absolutely. Um, when I was growing up, uh, I was really into UK electronic pop. So I'm talking bands like um, New Order, um, Tears for Fears, even the sort of more commercial pop that was on, but still electronic, things like Kim Wilde and Pet Shop Boys. Um, you know, I would I would collect every 12 inch from all of those bands, and um, I used to play them on the record player at home, and I used to re-edit them on the cassette deck and do all sorts of things with them. And then, so yeah, I was always listening to electronic music, but then I didn't really get into that sort of acid house dance phase until 88, 89. There was a show on a station in Liverpool called 2GLF that I could pick up on, on on the FM band where I was living. And it was broadcast on a Sunday night, it was in mono, really crunchy quality, but there was a guy on there called Ian, Ian, Ian Botham or Botham or something like that. And um, he used to do two hour mix of music off 12 inches live on the show, like nine to 11 o'clock. And it was the first time I'd actually heard dance music mixed together. But it was also, he was playing stuff that was massive at the time, but and also stuff that was really underground, things like Jack and the Sound of the Underground. Um, all the Acid House remixes of pop stuff, you know, even you know, people like Martika and uh, they all had Acid House or, or Shep Pettibone remixes. Um, so I used to listen to that and tape that and then go and find the record to Disco City in Parramatta. Okay. And that shop obviously doesn't exist anymore. And then HMV opened up in Parramatta, and that had everything pretty much. It was like a kid in the candy store sort of thing. So um, that's when I really started buying that sort of music. Yeah, I remember seeing the opening of HMV actually, which was uh, Indecent Obsession and Colette live, or live in inverted commas, playing on the top of HMV in Parramatta in Church Street Mall. That was hilarious. But also there was a DJ there. I think it was Stephen Hawkins actually, yeah. and he was um, playing hip hop at the time, which was kind of like Young MC mixed in with De La Soul and stuff, and he was mixing it. I was like, this is really cool. How are they doing that? You know. Yeah. So that was the sort of first introduction to Technics 1200s and how they're mixing records and putting them together and laying them over the top of each other. Yeah. So specifically, um, you think being from England made you sway? Um, for me, it, it, having that experience with the English guys, that's what put me on the I wouldn't say that. I, no, not for me, because I mean, I'm, I'm talking music from my biggest influences and stuff I still listen to a lot now are things from 83 through to 88. Yeah. And retro. You're retro, but yeah. it, quality electronic UK pop, yeah. I would call it. Um, and I'd say that coming from England, because pop music was such a massive thing there, more so than Australia, where it was more, more rock based in, in the 80s, yeah. pop music was all over Top of the Pops on BBC, yeah. one on Tuesday nights. And um, it was just everywhere. And you know, the charts would come out on a Tuesday, and I'd be at the record store Tuesday afternoon going through all the new releases and stuff. Even when I was like eight years old, I remember yeah. doing that. You know, I'd, So I'd say that coming from England, it swayed me more towards liking a melodic sense yeah. of 
of music rather than being just always down and dirty and, and no layer on top. I think most things I've, I've most sets that I do, whether I'm playing techno, trance, or house, there's always that element of melody over over the top, keeping keeping people interested, keeping some sort of emotion in the music. Yeah. And I think that's where it stems from. It definitely stems from um, a lot of the UK pop was very dramatic, you know, like 80s music is. Depeche Mode, for instance, you know, very dramatic music early on, you know, like Stripped and, you know, that, their Violator album, Enjoy the Silence, it's all really dramatic. And I think that's that sort of sense of melody and, and tone and um, emotion definitely is still in my sets these days, you know, I still look for, even though I like playing, you know, down and dirty, crusty sort of techno, yeah. I like every now and again to throw one in that sort of brings it all back to something that's a little bit uplifting. Yeah. Um, did your family have any influence on you? Yeah, this is my dad here. He was a um, jazz guitarist um, okay. on the QE2 or the Queen Mary yeah. in the 60s playing jazz and um, in a band. And I used to go out when I was young with mum and, and see him play. Yeah. Um, so in a, in a weird way, what he used to do for a living, I've just taken on board in a more modern form you know, DJing every weekend to other than he would be out on a boat or in a, in a, in a jazz club playing yeah, every yeah. weekend. So it's pretty much the same thing. But in saying that, at home it was terrible because we would clash all the time about what music was being played in the house. You know, because I didn't really like the jazz. I can appreciate it now, but I didn't like it when I was young. And he couldn't stand the pop music I was playing. So, um, yeah, there were always arguments about that. but. I guess just a sense of music and just being um, exposed to it at an early age, probably this is the reason why I got into it at yeah. so young, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that, or well, it moves us on from your dad and his music. What motivated you to start DJing? Hearing radio shows like that uh, one on 2GLF because that, I never ever thought of being a DJ in a club because I hadn't been to a club. I didn't know what a club was really. Um, I didn't know about raves, I mean, this, we're talking 88, 89, so uh, I heard this music being played, I, I saw people doing mobile DJ things in people's backyards out in the western suburbs yeah. and I thought, oh I want to do that. So I got myself a set of decks yeah. and um, I realised oh, that, they? Uh, uh, 1200s, yeah, 1200s. Yeah. I had a really strange phonic mixer early on and didn't have a crossfade or anything, but upgraded to a Vestax mixer later um, but <laughs> at the same time there was radio, sta radio FM radio stations were really big because that's what I was listening to you know I was listening okay well I want to do that as well yeah. so I, I went into 2RDJ as a volunteer and I used to sit in on a guy called Tony G's radio show it's called Tuesday Night Rage yeah. and um, I used to be his like phone boy just taking the messages and stuff and eventually he left and he gave me the show and then that radio show, start, I started doing that in 1990, and that lasted all the way through to 2003. Um, and that was every Tuesday night. So you said you volunteered, how did you? I just wrote them a letter and said, hey, I'm blah, 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 and I'd really like to become involved in the station and just word it correctly and come on in, you know? Did some work experience there, and then I said, oh. So there's a bit of an issue. Sorry? So there's a lot of an issue. Yeah, I think I, I definitely had a drive, yeah, and a drive to make it happen, yeah. Cause I, it's just because I was so interested in it. It was really my life, you know, like I didn't play sport. You know, in England, your activities as a youngster, it's it's soccer, computers, music, fashion, that's about it, right? Yeah. It's also fucking cold. Um, and I was just into music and computers. So when I came out to Australia as an 11, 12 year old, it was um, complete culture change, you know? Yeah. Everyone out here is playing soccer, playing footy and, yeah, yeah. you know, and also being out west, it was all Metallica and Iron Maiden, yeah, yeah, metal yeah, up yeah. your ass, yeah. you know? Football yeah, so it, I didn't really fit in yeah. and um, it wasn't until I was 16 where I created a radio station at school for recess and lunch. Um, <laughs> So you did it at school? Yeah, yeah, that's when it first started, 1990. I, yeah, it was 1990. So I... I what, what school is it? It's called Mitchell High yeah. out west. 
basically I, I organised a fun run and we got some money in from that so we had enough money to buy turntables and then somehow we got approval from the principal to um, make this radio station happen. So I was the director and you know, of it and I did this show as well. Um, and because of that suddenly I became this sort of going from like this nerdy guy that didn't speak to anyone to Mr. Popular, <laughs> and suddenly I was voted school captain. Yeah. You know, so it was just like, whoa, fuck! I don't want, I don't want to do that. You know, <laughs> um, but you know, I eased into it, and I think doing that and being pushed to have to have to do speeches at assembly and things like that, yeah. it sort of helped to give me some drive and some initiative, and go, oh, actually, I can do this. Yeah. I don't have to be that sort of scared little nerdy guy in the corner. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's that's where it comes from, I think. Yeah. So what, what was your first party? It's a two-part question. What was your first party first as a punter? Yeah. What was your first party as a DJ? Okay, if we're talking, I can't remember the small, tiny, tiny club gigs because there were definitely a lot of them in 2003. Um, I mean, dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were, there were. Do you remember your first? Like I remember porn rap. Yeah, yeah. So the first rave I went to was one of Bet- Brett Beetroot's parties in Harris Street car park, and I can't remember what it was called now. But um, it was it had uh, DJ Edge playing, had Force Mass Motion, and then locals. So it was the first time I really saw John Ferris, Pee Wee play. Um, they had a wicked Punyos chill out area, and the whole car park had been decked out with strobe lights. And I remember just trying to walk up the stairs to the event. It was so loud. Yeah. I just went, this is fucking awesome. <laughs> like, I've never experienced anything like that before, you know? Yeah. And people just dance. Was? Well, that was late, not 80, uh, late 93. Yeah. So that was my first rave. Yeah. But as I said, there were plenty of club gigs around, around where the radio station was because I was involved in doing their, their hip hop and their house parties. So, um, first, rave that I really got a gig at was probably Prodigy 6 Um, and it was the last set and it happened like this I was doing the radio show and by this stage in 93 it got quite a good following and it's sort of up with you know Music Aquarium you know something to listen to and um, Brett um, I used to get all the DJs and the promoters to come in and either promote their parties or um, DJs to promote themselves and do a set for free, you know. Yeah. It was kind of naughty because, you know, no money was paid to the station. <laughs> but, but back then we got away with it because none of the people that ran the station could bear to listen to the dance shows because they hated it so much, you know. So we, could, we kind of had free reign and ran amok. And myself and Jimmy Z really started off there. Uh, Jimmy C was the guy that did Wild FM and then later Nova. Okay. Um, uh, we started off there at 2 J, you know, 1990. So, Brett O'Meara came in and he did this thing and we got on well and he was a really nice guy. Uh, he said, look, I would love to give you a set. I don't know if I can give it to you this party, but you're coming anyway, aren't you? And I said, yeah, of course. So, I turned up there with records anyway yeah. and um, Vegas didn't show. It was the last set and Vegas was really late for a party. So okay. because of this, he said, you got your records? I went, yeah, he goes, get on. I went, fucking hell, there's like 3,000 people out there. Yeah. I went, okay, no worries. So I got out there, it was the first time I'd played to people. And I remember people like Georgie and Glenn from In House uh, and all that crew were, um, were in the crowd. They were my mates, you know. And so I had that support down in the corner. I went, let's just go for it. And I remember playing hardcore because Vegas was supposed to be playing. And I thought he's going to be playing hardcore. So I, remember, I think I started off maybe trancy and ended up hardcore. And then Vegas showed uh, after 45 minutes. And in those days, parties used to go over time. So it was, it was like eight, quarter to eight by that stage. I'm um, still pretty busy, you know. <laughs> and I went back to back with Vegas for another 45 minutes. And we were playing stuff like Ilsa Gold and, uh, you know, I'm the fuck you man and stuff like that. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Yeah. So that was my first quiz. And then from there on, the next ones were Prodigy 7 and I got a two and a half hour set of Prodigy 7. Yeah. Again, because a DJ didn't show and then, well, I had my own set at four o'clock. This is the one in the round where the set setup was in the round yeah. above the speakers. So you couldn't, look, no one could really see the DJ, but I could look down and see everyone. And there was five, 6,000 people at that party. And I played what I play at that party. So it was like, um, 
you know, Noom 6, yeah. that voodoo record I'd put up on Sydney Rave History recently and all, all those sorts of things and um, then moved into like some classics like Next to the E and things like that. And uh, yeah, had my set and then this guy after me didn't show and then whoever was next was 30, 30 minutes late. So I got two and a half hours up there and, and Brett, <laughs> Brett came up to me after an hour and said, mate, they haven't showed, do you want to keep going? I'm like, fuck yeah, like, this is awesome. By two and a half hours, I was mentally like, ripped apart, like, yeah. you know, because I'd been concentrating hard to get this right. This was my big break. Mm -hmm. Brett said, mate, that was awesome. I love the music and it was brilliant. And from there on, I got Field of Dreams 4, yeah. the one party that was supposed to happen and never happened, but I was highly billed on that. So all those early raves. And yeah, so I started getting raves from there. So that was like late 94, early 95. Yeah, going back to 2A and J, I just want to say, Bill Booth mentioned to me that he used to, was working at Macca's. Yeah. And they, when they were doing clean up. Oh, okay. They just been cranking. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> clean up with just the night shift. I still get people now, I mean, it's what, 2014, and that show was really popular from 94 to sort of 2000, I guess. And it's, it's 20, 25 years on, and people still on probably. Yeah. One a month, someone will come to, up to me and say, man, he's just on 2ADJ, and that's what got me into dance music. Yeah. And that's really humbling, you know, it's a really nice thing to hear, because that's exactly what happened to me. Yeah. You know, if I could meet the guy, whoever he is, yeah. that was doing that 2GLF show in 1998, yeah. I'd go up to him and say, mate, you know what, you're the reason I am who I am today, and, and you know, play the music that I play. I heard your sets back on 2GLA, tiny little radio station in Liverpool, um, back in the day, you know, and, it, and it's pretty much what set the tone for me, so, yeah. So on 2DOD, you said you would provide mixtapes to some of the promoters on the show. What was the music on the mixtapes? Who were the promoters? Well, this, this leads to a little another initiative marketing thing that I was yeah. doing early on. Um, and I think you, you're going to take some photos of this yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was doing this thing where I was telling people on air, the listeners, to send me their cash. <laughs> <laughs> Not checked, cash only, to a P.O. Box address in Newtown. Um, and in return, I'd send them a mixtape of my, you know, whatever I'd recorded at the time, one a month. It only lasted a little while, but because of that, I had abundance of mixtapes, and I used to I do them all, all different styles. So the first one was Happy Heart on one side and Happy Breakbeat on the other. And I think the, by the time we got to the third one, um, I'd really been introduced to trance, like Lipatik Prince Records was the first real trance record, yeah. a Steve Bolts record um, that a mate played to me. And I'm like, wow, no more of this piano house. Yeah. I want to play that. That's awesome. Yeah. It takes you on a journey, it's mind bending, you know, it's, it's not just one level, it's it's the whole package. Yeah. And um, from there on, that was late 93, and then 94, that's what really got me into Superstition Records, you know, and that was the big catalyst for me, listening to all those records like Paragliders, Humate, Jens, Loops and Tings, and yeah. Mami and Schoenberg and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah the mixtapes, um, I'd give you know, Brett O'Meara, a mixtape. You know, I think I gave him that one with the trance, and he really loved it. He said, "This is this is so cool. I love this, you know, stuff." So, yeah, I mean, as much as I could, I was trying to get him, not you know, be pushy, but get the mixtapes in people's hands. So yeah, you mentioned the two and a half hour set, it's a long set mm. to do the other do. And you also said that two hours obviously has some mixing talent. So, what was your regime? To be able to do what? Well, I've noticed if I DJ, I've got to really practice. I've got to do this. Yeah. How do I get? Oh it? yeah. Well, I wasn't working. No, actually, no, I was working during the day. I was working on and off in 90, 93, 94, when I really started to get the what opportunity. Maybe just ask you what's your daily, what's your daily regime? Yeah. Okay. So let's say ninety three. Yeah. I was working at Ashwood's Record Store, second hand record store in the city. So I was working pretty much full time, but I wasn't DJing that much by that, this stage. I was only doing the occasional club gigs, so I could just, you know, practice on the weekend. I was going to the parties, coming home, you know, a little bit wasted in the morning, get the decks out, bang, off you go. Um, yeah. <laughs> maybe cut that bit out, my mum my my might be listening to this. Um, 
Uh, oh, that's off the record. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Scratch. Uh, 94, uh, things have changed and I don't think I was employed because I was starting to play enough to survive. By the end of 94, Crash Bang Records, a record, uh, upcoming label here in Australia, yeah. had um, taken me on board full time to do product design and mix their CDs like Sundays and the anthems. And so that was a full time job. Um, I don't know, I was just a bit of a machine, I guess. I, I yeah. found the time to practice and um, I would, whenever I could, run the DAP play and record a set. I've got 150, 200 mixes from that period yeah. all the way through to 2001, 2002. That there's some really quality mixes there. I just basically get all the latest records I bought from Central Station because I spend yeah. two, three hundred bucks a week on records yeah. and just do a mix of everything at the end of the week yeah. and record it and listen back to the, in the car and just see what worked, yeah. see what worked with each other and then use that to, to prepare my sets. I used to put a lot of work, effort into preparation back yeah. then than I would now, you know, so it's, it was kind of like, uh, again, it was just a, a labour of love. I loved doing it, so it wasn't like a chore or anything. So whenever I had time, I'd play. You mentioned Central Station Records. Where did you access your vinyl back then? You mentioned well, HMV, I remember. Yeah, well, a lot of those shops in out west closed down because they weren't popular enough. And I used to come into the city. Well, no, I moved to Chatswood in, in 93, so I didn't I didn't need to worry about the western suburbs records shops yeah. anymore. From 93 on, it was all Oxford Street and Pitt Street. Yeah. And um, Pitt Street Central Station was a big seller of records to me. Yeah. Like, I met all the guys there, Joe and Morgan, and Tim McGee. Tim was probably a bit later at Central Station in Oxford Street. And reaching, I'd buy a few things from, but, um, and BPM, yeah, in the mid 90s, Ming D and uh, Milo. Milo used to be there. Yeah, all of those places. Uh, I used to buy a lot of second hand records. You know, back in those days, you'd find a lot of the latest records at places like Ashwood's for two, three dollars. Yeah. You know, I got a lot of classic records from Ashwood's in 93. That filled the collection for that year, and the, like the records I'd still pull out now, like Next is the E, original Kinetic, Golden Girls, all those classic things, Night in Motion, Cubic 22, yes. uh, Incubus, The Spirit, um, all the Prodigy stuff. And you've got to remember, a lot of that stuff was being sent out to reviewers and magazines like Drum Media, who were basically rock guys. So they would like, oh, this is dance music, we fucking hate this. They take it all down to Ashwood, sell it off for a dollar each. They buy it and then put it out on the shelf for three, four dollars. Yeah. So you get all the beloved records and you know all all that cool stuff for dirt cheap. So all the sunscreen singles, yeah, yeah. you know, a lot of secondhand trawling. I'd spend all Saturday trawling through records, yeah, yeah new and old. And how would you prepare for a set? Well, first thing I'd do is have a panic attack. <laughs> Then I'd spend a week pacing around, and then about three hours before the set, I'd go, fuck, I need to prepare something really quickly. <laughs> and then so. I'd grab the records and just go, okay, well that kind of goes with that, I know that from listening to, to it in the car, <laughs> and that would be work at the end of the set, and I'd kind of get all the styles I'd want to play in that set, because most sets would start off in one style and end up in another, purposely, because I liked playing a hybrid of sounds. Yeah. And um, so I kind of go, well that, kind of works there, but that won't work there because it's too fast. So, you know, it's exactly the same as what I did at Icky Thump the other day. Yeah. You know, I started off piano breakbeat, yeah. went through some house in the middle, like rave house, like positive feedback, kleptomaniacs. Went into some trancey acid stuff and finished up on a tallow house. I mean, God knows how that all fits into an hour and 15 minutes, but yeah. somehow it kind of worked. Yeah, it does. And um, that's exactly exactly what I used to do back in the day with, with records, you know? Yeah. I start off with something a bit more mellow, like Power of American Natives, maybe, Dance of Trance, and then finish up on Mandela, you know, Noom Records 10, something like that. And you, you, you'd often see me just touching the pitch control a little yeah. bit and just flicking it up a little bit in uh, the breaks of records just yeah. because I needed to get that ex a few extra BPM so that yeah. I could finish where I wanted to and what style I wanted to. Well, I noticed that when you, we first met. Yeah. Like, you went through my classic records and that, and when you played about pitch. 
Did I? I didn't expect. I was right. Like, wow. It's like hyper house. <laughs> well, there, there was. I also... noticed you think you like. It seems like you always like play a bit faster. Oh, I, I used, to, used to play a lot faster, yeah. but the, I think the only reason I did that on the day was because we were kind of going back to back. Um, once the tempo's set, you don't really want to go slower. You can always go faster, but go slower, yeah. it sounds a bit, yeah. you know, so, and we, we were pulling out things like Black Box and Jack to the Sound of the Underground, which were about 118 BPM. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a lot slower than the house that maybe you had started with. Yeah. And I was just trying to throw it in there, but normally I wouldn't play things out of pitch too much. Okay. It kind of does my head in a little bit now. But I listened to some of the mixes that I did back in, uh, you know, when, when I was with Central Station. We did peak time, which I did everything pretty much at, at pitch. But then the next one, full frequency, I noticed everything's about one plus two, plus four. Yeah. I listened to the CD now and it's like, oh, I wish I'd recorded that at proper speed because it's all a bit too fast for me now. But yeah. this is the thing, see, I was coming out of the rave scene and going into the clubs and the house, uh, it's like house music in the clubs, yeah. and I was trying to move my music into the ha into the clubs. So I was used to playing faster all the time, and I was trying to get over the 140 BPM and get down to 128 in my head, so it felt natural, you know. Yeah. Was it Prodigy Six? You said you had a panic attack before you went on. Hmm. We're talking about. That. I'm probably overstating it. I was a lot more confident, I think, back then than I am now. Because <laughs> back then I had nothing to lose. Yeah. Um, back then I didn't. I didn't give a shit. It was like all new and exciting. It was like, yeah, let's do it. You know. So yeah, no, it's it pretty cool. But you, you know, worried, freeze up. Or I'm never really mixing look, up. Everyone. Or everyone's ears. Or... I think everyone gets butterflies a bit, but yeah. I, I definitely would get a bit nervous. But it's good to be nervous because yeah. it means you care about what you're doing. You want to do it well. I think it wasn't until much later on, I got started to get panic attacks about playing and getting really anxious about playing sort of mid noughties, 2005, 2006. I think it's more down to, I was just burnt out. I was playing so much with all the Ministry of Sound stuff and touring all around the country and getting not, not getting enough sleep and um, you know, not having time to prepare. That's what it came, it came down to, not having time to really prepare and do know that I'm going to do it well before I get there because I just have to wing it because I didn't have time to prepare. Usually it would turn out alright but you know it was just uh, yeah you know anxiety bitch of a thing. That's the initial question. Cool. Is there anything you want to add about the early days? How early are we talking? Wanna... So we're, going, we're talking pre-Sublime days, aren't we? Yeah, we're talking what Sydney <laughs> Rave Histories bases itself from 88, 89 up to about 97. Yeah. And that's when most of us were pulled out. Right, or okay. Stop raving. Oh, okay, so right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, yeah, the rave still, scene. Some of us still came back into it, like I did, I came back into it again in 2002. The um, rave scene turned into this sort of super conglomerate thing, like where the only things left were big utopia parties, you know, of 10,000 people, rather yeah. than these small niche parties at the Hardcore Cafe or, yeah. or at um, Graffiti well, Hall yeah, of Fame. I can ask you about that, because I remember 94, when I first got back to the I was going to raves. Yeah. Big raves. But by 90, late 95, 96, we were just doing clubs, because we were sick of Happy Valley Fool and shit. You know, we just sort of went, because it was a guaranteed night. Yeah. yeah. I remember a distinct moment, actually, at Graffiti Hall of Fame, and I think it was 1996, and there was a party on there, and I can't remember what it was called, but um, things have been going downhill a, a little bit in 1995, early 96, in terms of mm. parties getting shut down, cops shutting everything down in South Sydney, um, you know, all the north side parties and the beaches have been shut down. It was just becoming really difficult to, to, to go to outdoor parties. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I remember being outside the graffiti hall and the cops had just shut down a party at 1 a.m. I, I think I said to myself, this, is, this could be the end of this. This is really like coming to a close. And I think I made a decision there and then that I needed to push myself more in this new house thing that was coming yeah, up. Yeah. This new house area, clubs in Sydney like Zoom yeah. and um, Sublime wasn't, didn't exist then. 
uh, I'll, I can't remember, I remember Jeff Lots the shopkeeper and people. Yeah. And there was parties over on the north side of Metropolis. Yeah. And I thought, you know, they're actually playing rave on some nights. I'm going to try and get into those guys. And, and I knew a lot of them from the radio station already. So it was kind of just a matter of making a phone call and, and saying, you know, when can you slot me on? And if they were up for it, they'd put me on. And, um, I did a few, quite a lot, well I did quite a lot of things actually, but then it wasn't until the Sublime thing when they took me on board of Sublime that I think I really got a following. Sublime and the Pit Street? Pit Street, yeah. yeah, yeah. So then Friday night, Voodoo, I didn't start when, I, when Voodoo opened. I didn't come on board until probably three months into it. Yeah. I think what happened, they opened and they don't think they were reading don't think they thought it would go past sort of 3 a.m. and then they realized that it had to get to 6 a.m. people yeah. really wanted more so they said well we need a DJ for 3 a.m. we'll close the back room at 4, 4 a.m. and bring everyone out the front and um, they said do you want to do it and I said well yeah it's a, so um, and it just worked really well you know everyone would come out I'd start off on house and I'd um, play all the records at the time like Slacker, Scared you know Space Brothers um, Stuff on Bonza even, you know, um, Black Master, and it would get a little bit trancey and a little bit deep, and then it would come out and be a little bit vocal, you know? Yeah. And I remember when breaks started happening in 99, I was playing breaks in there as well, so um, that was really when people went, oh, who is this guy, you know? Yeah. And they'd follow me from Sublime to um, Pavilion, and I'd do the recovery set at Pavilion from six to eight or nine. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty much DJing straight from Sundays. three to nine. No, 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 oh. Saturday mornings as well. Yeah. So I do Saturday and Sunday this mornings. This is the Glenn. Not the Sunday from Glenn. This is a, no, no, that, that's earlier. You're talking yeah, about Sunday. Yeah. I'm talking about just the Pavilion recovery in '97, '98, '99. Well, it went on for years, but um, yeah, people would come down there, and the tortured trance had just started happening there from Germany. You know, all that sort of floaty stuff. And early Ferry Corsten was a lot less hard yeah. um, and uh, playing all that stuff and that was a new sound and that used to sound great in the pavilion and you'd have people in there sort of coming out of their <laughs> their headspace just yeah. like wow you know really getting into it and letting go yeah. and it kind of reminded me of feral parties a little bit you yeah. know where people just let go and just absorb the music yeah. but I was playing a little bit more commercial but on a German tip yeah. not the sort of German access you know, I mean like DJ Mischa sort of thing, more floaty and, and that I think because I was the only one playing that sound at the beginning, maybe Jumping Jack did a little bit as well, yeah. Um, I think I got a bit, a bit of a following from that which was really really where it kicked off. Yeah. But a different we'll to the racing. Yeah. Time quickly. I still, there's a newspaper clipping and I'm gonna photo of you fifteen. Oh yeah. Station. Yeah. You describe it? Yeah, well, um, it goes back to what I said before about doing volunteer work at 2RDJ, yeah. and I'd just been given a so shot. That's 2RDJ, that photo? That's not at 2RDJ, that's in my bedroom. Oh, you can Yeah, so, <laughs> at the time. So, 2RDJ had said, hey, Tony G's leaving, do you want the radio show? And I said, yes. And because of that, uh, I, think, I think I said to someone at school that, or even my mum and dad, I can't remember, that um, I wanted to uh, market it, promote it, so people would listen to it, you know? Yeah. So, and I didn't know how to do that, but someone got in touch with someone at the, I just, it's so long ago, I can't remember, but someone got in touch with someone at the newspaper, and the newspaper, a couple of, two newspapers called up and said, um, do you want to uh, do an interview and a photo shoot? And I said, yes. And they came around to the, to the house and took photos of me in front of my Commodore 64, oh, yeah. Ghetto Blaster, and my, um, Modern CD player. Yeah. All right. We can leave it there.
You're listening to Addiction Radio. Old school, the new cool.